Another interesting case is when the characteristic equation has complex roots. Well, it's a quadratic equation, so it's possible to, to have complex roots. And let's see an example where this is the case. Consider the recurrence relation Tn equals 2 times Tn minus 1 minus 2 times Tn minus 2 with the initial values of T0 equals 2, T1 equals 4. Now, if you write the characteristic equation, that is r square minus 2r plus 2 equals 0. And if you solve this, you will see that this has complex roots uh, where the first one is 1 plus j and the second is 1 minus j. Obviously, if, if you're not aware, let me repeat, j here represents the imaginary unit, the square root of minus 1. And for a quadratic equation, and of course, in, 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 in the more general case of uh, uh, equations of uh, order more than two, uh, if you have complex roots, you will have them in complex conjugate pairs. So for instance, I have one plus j here, and obviously that tells me that I should also have one minus j because the coefficients of my um, original equation are real numbers, um, the solution if I have uh, complex roots in my solution, they will appear as conjugate pairs. And actually the rest is not really the, any different than what we have done earlier. So the solution is going to be of the form K1, some constant times one plus J to power N plus K2, one minus J, uh, one minus J to power N. And K1 and K2 here, the only difference is that instead of reals, they may be complex numbers, but still they are coefficients, constant coefficients. Um, in, in, in the other case where we do not have complex roots, then the coefficients would be real numbers also. But in this case, uh, the coefficients uh, might appear to be complex too. Now, this is the general uh, form of the, the solution. And the next step is clearly plug in the initial values, t0 equals 2, t1 equals 4. And this gives you k1 plus k2 equals 2, because if you plug in n equals 0, this is 1. This is also 1. So that gives you k1 plus k2, and that is given as 2. And if you plug in n equals 1, this gives you k1 times 1 plus j, and this gives you k2 times 1 minus j equals 4. Okay, now how are you going to solve this? Um, if you arrange this, you'll see that this is k1 plus k2 plus j times k1 minus k2 equals 4. So this is essentially a complex number by itself. Um, this may not be the, the real and this the imaginary part because k1 and k2 themselves might be complex numbers. Uh, but you see, I have k1 plus k2 here, which I know from this equation to be equal to 2. So that means this part should be also 2, okay? Which means uh, j times k1 minus k2 equals 2. Therefore, k1 minus k2 equals minus 2j. Right, um, that means I can write K2 as K1 plus 2J. And when I put this in this first equation, K1 plus K2 equals two. And I know that K2 equals K1 plus 2J equals two. This means this is two K1 plus 2J equals two, therefore, K1 turns out to be 1 minus J, which tells me that K2 should be 1 plus J due to this relation. Now that I have K1 and K2, the solution is ready. K1 times 1 plus J to power N plus K2 times 1 minus J to power N. So the solution is 1 minus J times 1 plus J to N plus 1 plus J times 1 minus J to N for n greater than or equal to zero. If you want, you can plug in n equals zero 
and n equals one to verify these values are satisfied, which I'm not going to do. You can do it because it's quite simple, but I would like to point out to you that this expression doesn't look like it's a real number. There are a lot of J's here. So your first inst instinct might be, this looks like a complex function. So how are you going to be sure that this is a real sequence? Because you see T0 is two, T1 is four. And then my recurrence relation is given here. T1 is defined in terms of Tn minus one and Tn minus two. Everything is real. Coefficients are real. So in, in, in the process, I shouldn't encounter any imaginary parts here. I, I, I shouldn't see any complex numbers. So this doesn't look like a real function. So is it? So to be able to do that, to, to see that, um, we'll write this in, in polar form. And if, if you remember, you can write A plus the BJ, the, the, the complex number A plus BJ, where A and B are real numbers. Um, in such a way that you have the, uh, the, the magnitude of this uh, complex number times e to the power j theta, where theta is uh, the angle of this number, okay? So if you recall, let's say this is a, this is b, and this is my complex number a plus bj, so this is the real axis and this is imaginary axis let's say and this is my number a plus b times j and this is this here is the uh, the magnitude and this here is the angle of course it doesn't have to be in the first quadrant it, it could be something like this in which case this would be the angle but you get the idea how do you find it you obtain the magnitude by, of course, taking square root of a square plus b square. And the angle is provided here. Depending on which quadrant you are, you have to uh, compute the, the, uh, the inverse tangent of b divided by a. Um, in this case, this is my function one minus j times one plus j to power n plus one plus j times one minus j to power n. I can write each of these one minus j for instance, corresponds to what? One here and minus j is here. So it's one, one here and minus one here. So this is one minus j. And clearly the angle here is pi over four but actually it's minus pi over four because, well, this is my angle, okay? Therefore, I can write this as, well, the magnitude is also square root of one square plus one square. It's square root of two. So this is the magnitude uh, times e to the power minus j times pi over four because the angle is minus pi over four. And one plus j on the other hand corresponds to one in the real axis and also one in the imaginary axis. And the magnitude is again square root two, but now the angle is plus pi over four. So I'm going to write this as square root two e to the j pi over four raised to power n, okay? Plus, now I have one plus j here and one minus j to power n. These are the same numbers, so I can use them. And then if you arrange those, you get square root two here, square root two to power n. So you get square root two to power n plus one times what? E to the power j times pi over four raised to power n. That gives you j times n pi divided by four. And I also have this minus j pi over four. Therefore, I have e to the power j times pi over four times n minus one. And a similar expression here, square root two to power n plus one times e to the power. Now this time I have minus j times n pi over four uh, plus j pi over four. And this is the expression, okay? Uh, this still looks like a complex value. 
But at this point, if you actually apply uh, Euler's identity, and let me also put it here, e to power j theta is simply equal to cosine theta plus j times sine theta. And therefore, here you have, for this, you have square root 2 to power n plus 1 times this term is going to be cosine pi over 4 times n minus 1 plus, again, square root 2 to the power n plus 1 um, j times sine pi over 4 n minus 1. But you see here, I will have the same term with the negative sign in, in the cosine and sine expressions. You see cosine is an even function, which means cosine theta is equal to cosine minus theta, but sine is an odd function and sine theta is equal to minus sine minus theta. Therefore, if you add sine theta, whatever theta is, plus sine minus theta, you'll get zero. So the complex term here, the imaginary part, consisting of the sine term here in this, and in this one, they are complex conjugates of each other. And when you add them up, they will cancel each other out, okay? So what you will have is uh, square root to the power n plus one times two, because you have two terms, times cosine pi over four n minus one, and that square root two to the power n plus one times two can be expressed as two to the power n plus three over two times the cosine term. Now you see this function here is obviously a real function. 